up here, we have Andy Flam. Andy, hello Andy. Andy is the owner of Cedar Printing on the Skyway and a board member of the District 17 Capital River Council. Andy serves as chair of the Skyway Committee and has written about his ideas on how to make the Skyway system more vital. Joining Mr. Flam is Officer Thomas Radke. Hello, Officer. Thomas Radke is the investigative and force commander of the Central District of the St. Paul Police Department. Let's welcome both our panelists to the I guess just to get started, I wanted to ask you both, generally, several decades, close to half a, close to half a century, I guess, into this Skyway experiment here in the Twin Cities. Do the Skyways make our lives better? Are they a net positive for us, Andy? Well, I would certainly say so. I have a business on the Skyway, and it makes it a lot easier for people to do business with me. I believe most of you are probably residents here, and I'm sure you would all agree that the Skyways make life a lot easier for you. One thing I think people don't always think about is that they not only protect us from the weather, but they also keep us off the streets where there are, you know, cars running by and such. I think they just make life a lot safer for us. Officer Redford? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it makes life a lot easier when it's cold out. I think it allows more commerce, it allows people to get places faster, it allows them to not wear their coat in the winter all the time. Um, I think it brings, you kind of get the double, you get the sidewalk people and you get the skyway people. So, yeah, I think it has improved the quality of life. We're calling this event tonight, State of the Skyways. Can you just give me a, maybe a brief one minute state of today's skyways? Officer Radke, if you'd like to start. Well, you know, the skyways right now, it's a challenging time for a lot of reasons. We have a lot of new people moving in downtown for residential. We have a central corridor for business. And then we have the entertainment district as we get further down by Dorothy Day, down by the SL Energy Center. So there's a lot of demands on the Skyways today. Um, the Skyways are roughly 40 years old. Uh, they probably need some upkeep, maybe a new coat of paint. So there are some things we can do there. Some of the rules of the Skyways uh, haven't kept up to date than, than what they probably should have. So right now it's a challenging time in the, in the Skyway areas. And I would just add to that that Yes, it's a challenging time, but overall, I think the Skyways are a safe, pleasant place to be. It's just certain areas of the Skyway and certain times that problems flare up, and that's what we're trying to work on. I'm guessing most folks in this audience already know the basics here, but just not to take anything for granted, can we go over the basics of who owns the Skyways in St. Paul? It's different than Minneapolis. What is the public-private partnership that drives this thing? Why don't I take that? Um, the Skyways were built with public funds, at least mostly. The passageways through private buildings were created by easements, which uh, the city, where, whereby the city and the buildings agreed that they would become quasi-public thoroughfares. And sorry. Okay. Um, and. Uh, Basically, by creating the Skyway system, the buildings that were connected to the Skyway would rise in value, and therefore the buildings agreed to provide maintenance and security for the Skyway system. So the answer to who owns the Skyways is the city owns the bridges, the buildings own their buildings, but there are easements going through the buildings that allow the city to have passageways. Thank you. And with that in mind, Officer Radke, what is currently allowed in the Skyways? What do the, the rules say today? Well, they're governed by rules of what we call 140, Section 140 of the Code, of the City Code. And right now, it has its own code, but it's being updated. So, you know, the same rules apply as they do on the street, only there are some tweaks because of the Skyway. Um, and that's kind of where the challenge has become because part of that code has not kept up to date. Some of the code was updated in 1956, and we're a little ways past that. And, and one thing that what we think today is disorderly, or I should say what we thought 10 years ago is disorderly today is free speech. So some of the stuff hasn't up been updated or, or brought forth in a timely manner, and that's kind of where we're getting the conflict problems with some of the quality of life issues in the sky right well, let me ask you based on, oh, Brian, do you have a good email question? Yeah, we do. Um, one viewer is asking, is panhandling illegal in the Skyway? Good question, thank you. No, it's, it's not. Uh, right now, panhandling, that's one of them. Uh, 
that we're looking at it as far as redoing. The Supreme Court has struck that down and set up free speech in today. So we're not able to aggressively enforce the panhandling statute in the city code right now. You know, if I may ask, when you're not in a room full of people, when you're talking to your fellow officers, how, how do peace officers think of the Skyways? Are these a pain for you? Are these a, an asset? I mean, what's the real conversation like when we're not listening? Oh, I mean, they're an asset. I mean, they're an asset, I think. I, I, I mean, we get positive reviews from them. Guys like working in them. It's a different challenge. It gets them out of the car and interacting with everybody that's here. It's interacting with the business community, kind of on foot, kind of back and forth, back in a beat day. So it's a positive thing. It, it comes down to time, call volume. There's a lot of things that factor into that. Um, but by and large, they, they enjoy the people of personal contact. And then Andy, kind of playing out the description earlier of ownership, um, a lot of people have questions about access points. What are the times that these open and close? Who controls those? Where the Skyway interfaces with the street level, what's sort of the, the politics and the structure around that? Well, first of all, you can always get out of the Skyway. That's called egress. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can always exit. As far as coming in, it depends on the uh, activity within the building. If the building has tenants who are open, such as bars, restaurants, etc., then the ingress doors need to be open during the times that those uh, businesses are open. However, if a uh, building's tenants are all gone by 6 p.m., uh, the building can choose to close their doors to ingress at 6 p.m. Okay, great. We're almost running out of time on this first panel conversation, but I guess I want to give both of you the opportunity based on your experience. I know you've been involved in other conversations like this. What changes do you think make sense from your personal point of view to our policies overall? Well, I think updating the criminal code is, is the first step in the right direction of getting the input from the community that what they expect and what they want. Because I think downtown has changed so much. It's not, you know, late season of the year anymore. And so we have a, a, a certain segment of population that calls it the neighborhood. It's, it's where they live. So they have different needs. And then we have to meet that with the commerce section and, and with the entertainment section. So it, it's quite a challenge. And I think I think the department's up for it. But it really depends on the, the people and what they want. I mean, that's really, we're responsive to what they want. And I would say, uh, I touched on it earlier, but the, um, the easement agreement with the building uh, states that the building owners are responsible for security in their buildings, but the, the easement maybe didn't make uh, that very specific as to what level of security is required. And the city is working on making those requirements more specific. Um, and I think that that, that in combined uh, combined with other efforts by building owners are really crucial to making the Skyways safer for everybody. Okay, well thanks to both of you, Brian. Any other email questions you want to get into this Not at this time. Uh, so while we change chairs, I'll just go over some quick uh, headlines from the neighborhood. Coming this September, we have the main attraction, Treasure Island Center. Uh, current abbreviations are being thought out, either TI or the TIP. We'll see what, what picks up. Uh, more to come on that. But the Wild has signed a lease. Uh, Tim Horton, which is a Canadian coffee and donut shop, is also going to be opening in there, which is a great uh, compliment to hockey, I think. Uh, Stack Deck Brewing has signed their lease. Tria Health has signed a lease, uh, as well as Walgreens actually closing on their purchase. And the police department will also be there too. Uh, the Port Story is really hoping that this will energize the Skyway, and especially that kind of dead area around between Mears Park and Rice Park. Uh, moving on, we have some other headlines. The 428, now that's the former Woolworths building. Uh, and they broke ground on June 7th, eco-friendly eco redevelopment. It will be office space primarily. And I think they're the first building in the state of Minnesota to go for both a LEED certification and a WELL certification. So more to come on that. Uh, also, we have some area restaurants and bars that have just opened. The Great Oak Tavern, right across from City Hall and the County Courthouse. So where we, when we can't find our government officials, I think we know where they will be. <laughs> and then we also have 12 Eyes Brewing, which will be opening in the next month in the Pioneer Undercut building. So neat little historical place with some cool art that they'll have up on the walls. 
and Barrel Theory Beer Company also opened, I think, just the last week or two. So uh, they are right next to Dark Horse, Dark Horse Green on Seventh Street. So. And by the way, if you are watching this on SPNN, and even in a replay, we still want to hear your email comments. So that Downtown Quarterly Live still works at Gmail, most spaces. Please do send in your comments. We'll be aggregating all those, and they will make a difference in this conversation. So for our second panel, three new panelists have joined me here on stage. Um, I'll introduce Jerry Hurstman first. He is the Vice Chair of the St. Paul Business Owners and Managers Association, or BOMA. I will use that acronym a lot tonight. Uh, uh, board and a member of the Skyway Vitality Work Group. He is well-versed on the security initiative. Uh, Council member Rebecca Naker is here. She is a community builder and advocate for social justice, a wife and mother, and a proud resident of St. Paul's West Side. In 2015, Rebecca was elected to represent Ward 2 on the St. Paul City Council, the first woman elected to serve Ward 2, and the youngest member of the City Council. Equity and economic development are her priorities. And last but not least, Dan Nagelic, and he told me beforehand, it's just like Angelic. <laughs> Dan Angelic Nagelic serves as Deputy Director of the Department of Safety and Inspections, or DSI, for the City of St. Paul. For over 25 years, Dan has worked to create innovative government services that benefit the diverse members of our community, private citizens, as well as the business community. Dan is committed to innovation, to creating greater access to public services and to public safety. Let's welcome our second panel. Uh, Jerry, we're going to kick things off with a minute or two each and kind of the update from your perspective. Uh, the mic is yours. Go ahead. Thank you. And I'd also like to um, thank all those that helped organize the event for the participants here and the attendees. So it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to talk about these issues. And they're very fluid right now. So uh, it's, uh, hopefully this is a helpful conversation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, the vice chair of St. Paul BOMA. And to kind of frame that a little bit, uh, BOMA is an international organization based in Washington, D.C. There's approximately 92 chapters in the country and probably another 15 to 20 around the world, including Russia, China, Mexico, Argentina, Panama, you name it, uh, all dealing with building ownership and the management of buildings and then the service providers that serve those buildings. Um, so it's a um, worldwide organization that St. Paul and Minneapolis are a little bit unique. We each have our own chapters. And we're the only place in the world that has two chapters this close together. Chicago has one chapter for all of Illinois. Um, it's rather unique. But we, but we we deem that St. Paul is such a vibrant market as a standalone that um, it's worthy of having its own chapter because there's issues that are very personal to St. Paul that uh, nothing against our neighbors to the west, but if Minneapolis ran the Twin Cities chapter. We believe that St. Paul would get kind of short shrift of that, uh, that relationship. So we're here to serve you also. Now, I know there's been some um, past discussions or concerns that the buildings, uh, which I'm more or less the representative here, are trying to ram through things that are against the residents. Um, again, I serve on the board of St. Paul MoMA, and I can say that um, we are trying to be good neighbors. And um, if I can explain one part of this kind of going forward, uh, St. Paul Bowman created uh, an, org an entity called the St. Paul Downtown Alliance uh, about three years ago, which was meant to pull in interested parties that are serving downtown specifically, but that uh, were concerned about the, the curb appeal, the cleanliness, safety, and security, uh, because we're also trying to recruit more economic development, as Council Member Naker is here, into the downtown core, which drives the tax base, which drives City financing. And um, out of that, we started sensing a year ago, uh, what else can we do? And about a year ago, we created a downtown security counter committee that started looking at some of the issues that were rising up with the creation of the light rail into the city and some uh, added uh, uh, issues that needed to be addressed and more of a concerted effort. And out of that, we have, uh, that committee, we recently uh, got the building owners together and created a fund, privately funded, of, of, to, to go out and to hire a consultant that can do two things. One is the risk assessment study of the downtown core from safety and security standpoint, and this is from basically 35E to, to 
the same stadium CHF field to 94 down to the river. And uh, the second part of that is to come up with a recommendation on how we can improve the safety and security in downtown core. The status of that RFP, the request for proposal at this time, it is out to seven uh, national consultants that are looking at the proposal right now, or the proposal, I should say. Uh, and that is due back approximately June, July 13th, and then we'll spend the next month uh, assessing the proposals that came in, doing some more quantitative uh, questions and answers with those vendors, and then look to hire a consultant around August 13th uh, to go forward for the next 120 days, and hopefully by year end, we will have this uh, risk assessment study completed as well as a recommendation of how we can improve uh, safety and security. It's, it's not meant to be a reaction to concerns that are raised up, it's really meant to be more of a strategic initiative to increase the vibrancy of the downtown core. Uh, it's been part of, like I said, this three year uh, initiative we've had in place to really improve the image uh, going forward of St. Paul. Not that it needs to be improved that much, but it's um, I think just to make it its best. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Council Member Baker. Well, thank you so much to everyone for coming out tonight. I know it's a beautiful evening, and I really appreciate you spending your time engaging in this important issue. And thank you again to Capital River Council uh, for hosting this important conversation. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited to be here tonight, mostly just to listen. And I know we're going to spend most of our time tonight doing that. We're embarking on a really important conversation right now. Not just about what we want our skyways to be, but I actually think the skyways are really a microcosm of our downtown in general. And many others have said this tonight, but our downtown is changing, and I think mostly in wonderful ways. We are becoming a bigger city, which is vibrant, which is open 24 hours a day, which is exciting, which is bringing in people for all reasons, to work, to play, to go to school, to take advantage of all of our exciting nightlife. Um, and, and with that growth come big city challenges, and that's, I think, what constantly the job of, of public policy is, is to wrestle with those challenges um, together. So that's really what the conversation's about, and um, you know, one of the things I heard from the very beginning when I took office a year ago was the sense that the, the problems in the skyways were, were becoming bigger than they had been before, and, and really that people felt like there needed to be action taken and there needed to be leadership. People did not want to hear other people pointing fingers at each other, government bodies saying it's that group's responsibility, um, but they really wanted to see things getting done. So uh, I went back and I'm really grateful to the mayor's office, to uh, Deputy Mayor Kristen Beckman who's here tonight and I really appreciate her leadership on this. Um, and the two of us are co-chairing the Skyway Vitality Work Group, which basically brings together all the different parties, and there are six different city departments alone that are responsible for some aspects of the Skyways. And in addition to that, the building owners, residents, business owners, people who represent individuals who are experiencing homelessness, youth, all of those groups to the table to tackle three big issues, security, maintenance, and vibrancy in our skyways, because we see all three of those as interrelated. Uh, so we've been meeting monthly for the last five months, and one of the best advantages of this group is that we're able to do things in about five minutes that would have taken five weeks over email, because instead of going back and forth, we can just have the conversation right there. And one of the very first things that we realized when we started talking was that our ordinances, as were mentioned earlier, really needed an update. We have had, um, very inconsistent enforcement, it's been unclear to our officers what parts of the code of conduct they could enforce. Our different building owners are doing different different levels of security and it was unclear exactly what we expected of them as part of our easement agreements. Uh, and so one of the first things that we we're doing and we're, we're in the process of doing that now is to update those ordinances. So um, I know that Dan Angelic is going to talk about <laughs> did, did you, by the way, did, did, you see what Bill, did you see what Bill just did to me? He's still doing it. He's still producing me. Give me the note. Okay, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it inappropriate. No, we think the projector just died, so Dan's going to do his PowerPoint without PowerPoint. Oh, well, we'll see if he's angelic after all, I guess. Can you, pull, can you do this without the PowerPoint? Is this, or do you need the visual? Can I just one more thing? I segue that before I was quite ready to turn it over. Can I just say one more thing? You may. Thank you. Uh, and so just, just one more point on the note of trying to gather feedback. All of the ordinance amendments are proposed. They are in pencil. I haven't even put them in front of my colleagues yet because the first thing I want to do was to put them in front of you. 
So we handed out a survey. If hopefully the first 50 people here, lucky winners, got a survey. Um, otherwise, please uh, feel free to email my office. Let me know what you think tonight. But I'm really here to hear your feedback. So. Uh, where can people get a copy of the ordinances for building owners? Yep. So uh, well, one of the things we can do is email those out to people who came tonight. But they're also up on, I think they're on our website, um, on, my, on the Warby website. They may also be on the DSI website. Good evening. Great to see everybody out tonight and to echo Jerry and Councilmember Nature. I want to thank the Capitol River Council for hosting tonight, but more importantly for yourselves for coming out. At CSI, what we find, we do our best work, but we have all the people at the conversation when we have the conversation. We have a very important conversation, I believe, right now going on with the St. Paul and that's regards to our skyways, which is a, a central part of the vitality that we see downtown. So it's great to have you yourself here tonight to engage in that conversation. We're looking forward to your feedback. We can bring that into the overall conversation as we, as we move forward. I'm going to give just a quick tutorial in terms of what we do at the Department of Safety and Inspections around the Skyways and how we sort of where we went. So we're sort of getting us all on the same issue of music. Talk a little bit about the ordinance proposal and so as Council Member Maker, get to yourself to get some feedback. So really quickly, the Department of Safety and Inspection uh, we have a lot of responsibilities when it comes to skyways. First of all, if there's a maintenance issue, a, um, a security issue, or a locking door issue, um, give us a call, 651-266-8989. So you have carpets that aren't being cleaned, issues and things like that. We deal with maintenance issues around the skyway. First of all, maintenance issue, DSI 8989. Uh, second of all, we do with um, if somebody for hours, let's say, uh, coming out of construction, we have new carpeting going in by Capital City Ramp. Uh, we get requests for temporary closure of skyways to allow construction, but also then sometimes there's permanent closures. For temporary closures, we do them administratively. For permanent closures, we do the investigation, go to the Skyway Government Committee, and then pass on to the council for a decision regardless of that. So if there's any requests for change in hours, short term or long term, it goes to the Department of Safety Inspection. We also deal with um, uh, youth questions. Um, you might have seen over the past few years different types of things going on in the skyways. We've had um, bands, we've had jumping kangaroos, and a variety of other things. And you'll be seeing some art coming to the skyways this coming fall. When somebody wants to do something in the skyway proper, uh, they come to us. We make sure that the property owners have agreed to it, as well as the liability. We make sure that the public easement is protected, and then we can grant those. So whenever there's a land use question, that comes to us. So those are some things we do. In addition to that, we make sure that everybody's sort of doing their part around Skyway. Skyway, as has been mentioned before, is this great public-private partnership. As community organizer, I think that's when the city does the best, is when we do public-private partnerships. And this is one of the things. But again, the key. It doesn't always work exactly the way you want, but it's always a good outcome when we come together and work on that. So based on what we've seen over the past few years working in the Skyways, there's a number of 2017 projects we're working on that have been mentioned already. First of all, it comes down to maintenance. Uh, we've been feeling a little um, inability to deal with some of the maintenance issues. So coming uh, in the near future, we're going to be working on updating the ordinance around maintenance to give us better tools to make sure that all property owners are doing what they need to do. What we see is the majority of the property owners are doing a great job maintaining the skyways, but we got some spots we need to bring that level up. Our job as a formal extension community is to make sure the standard's clear for everybody and that we have the tools to do with it. But it's also, as uh, Council Member Nature mentioned, as well as Commander Radke, is the security issues. One of the things that we find is in the code right now, it's not very clear in the easement and in the ordinance what is the responsibility of private property owners around the security requirements? In the ordinance, it talks about providing reasonable observation and patrolling in the skyway during the hour. Doesn't give me a lot to work on when I want to say to them, we need to do more of that. So what we're looking at is making it very clear to our private property with an easement. What does it mean to provide business available? What does it mean to provide patrolling security? Um, in the ordinance right now, they're required to provide either or during all operating hours. But it doesn't say what either or is. So for video surveillance, what we're talking about is during all operating hours of the Skyway, they have to be monitored. Not just having a camera that's recorded, but being monitored. As well as the person monitoring, you need to be able to, if they see a person who needs to understand the Skyway rules or the building rules, is to leave the street and go talk to that person and move them along. Uh, with the idea that it's a lot of times just advising people, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
same the resource of the St. Paul Police Department, and it's something that is the responsibility of a private property. So video surveillance is one option. Monitoring all over the Skyway, but also advising people of Skyway rules and behavior. Uh, this other option is patrolling. And what is you know, patrolling? When we say patrolling, we're looking at a security presence. We're not expecting private property owners to have additional security guards, but have people who are properly trained upon resort, observe, report, and advise. The idea that, just like yourselves, you know, in terms of making sure people know what the rules are and moving people along. And what we're looking for standard-wise is that once per hour, every part of their skyway will have somebody walk through, observe, report, and advise people on skyway rules and building rules. So the idea that we'll have that presence. If it's needed, they call in St. Paul Police Department to deal with the issues that people aren't um, being responsible. So Dan, quick question from the audience. Speaking of uh, security responsibilities, what is the Met Council's role? Um, the Met Council role, so that would be the question I'm assuming is the vertical connection. Is that, am I correct? Yeah, so I think, and I think the question is related to the vertical connection. That is actually not captured by the Skyway ordinance or by any easement at this current time. So that's one of the things in terms of as we look at moving forward is making sure that conversation with the Met Council is happening too as them as being a partner with us with the city of St. Paul. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, is there a, the vertical connection, central station, where the tower goes up? Uh, anybody know where it's at? Anybody not know the vertical connection? Yes, go ahead. Just to add one thing to that, um, Metro Transit is responsible for the vertical connections as a function of the Met Council is at the Skyway Vitality Workers Table, so uh, the parents and joints are there um, for Metro Transit to meet, and so we, we have involved them in those conversations, and that is the first time that they have really been um, part of any, any such table, so that's a really important addition. Thank you. So uh, we want to keep moving because we have a lot to get to, but the one question I wanted to get to this panel, and maybe I'll go to you, Council Member Maker, ADA, Human Rights Act, Ordinance Compliance, how does that tie into this conversation? It's something a lot of people are thinking about. Yep, so um, ADA and, and other sort of human rights accessibility issues, those all apply regardless of, of where in the city you're talking about. So the Skyway Code of Conduct has um, specific provisions for how we want people to behave in the Skyways, our building security provisions detail exactly how we expect private property owners to maintain their easements and secure them, but none of that overrides the basic obligations of, of ADA. So if you have a business in your building that needs ADA access and that's through the Skyway, that's a, that is entirely the, the building owner's responsibility to maintain over and above any code of conduct or security issues in the Skyway. Okay, we have to keep going. That means we're going I really apologize, but there's one really critical uh, ordinance proposal before that is being bring forward, and that is uh, moving the Skyway hours from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. to midnight. So that's one to make sure that the, the city is aware. That's another ordinance proposal currently that's going before the council that we'd love to hear from the city about no, the, the changing of the hours proposal. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Brianna, next news update, and we'll get to audience participation. Well, it's not as fun without the PowerPoint, but <laughs> let's try to liven it up. Uh, Mears Park, the light, the mess is over. Uh, we'll, there will be 12 light poles now with LED bulbs. Uh, concrete should be poured this week and completion week of July 17th, so look out for that. Uh, Dorothy Day Phase 2, so that facility did receive the binding request that uh, they put in with the state. Uh, for the Opportunity Center, which will provide support services such as mental health, uh, medical, and other services, as well as some permanent healthy. The former West Publishing Building, which is on Kellogg Boulevard, uh, that will be moving along uh, as I believe Cardone Development Company is on that project to include a four-star hotel, some residential units, as well as office and retail. So we could use a little retail down here. And last but not least, the Minnesota Museum of American Art. Uh, they are expanding inside the Pioneer Underpass building. So look for some completion on that mid-2018. So sorry it's not as exciting without the PowerPoint, but back to you, David. Thank you. I'm actually I'm just going to keep moving here because I think this is your best solution. So, Brianne, you're going to head out to the audience yeah. to help us out. This is where you get involved. Officer Rad keeps coming back up, and all our panelists will now stay up here. Can you give me a second? Yeah. Bye-bye. 
All right, so this is where we want input. Um, again, just a reminder, if you're just tuning in on SPNN, we do want your input, even if you're watching this in a, a rebroadcast format. Uh, DowntownLiveQuarterly at gmail.com, that's the way to do it. We'd love to hear from you. So now, and, and also just for SPNN, I'm gonna ask a show of hands question if you wanna pull out for just a second. But I'm curious, just kind of general self-identification to the audience tonight, how many of you think of yourselves as residents? in your interaction, okay, a lot of hands. Uh, business community? Do we have any non-St. Paul residents who are just, you know, Saints fans come downtown? Mm -hmm. Okay, there, there we go. All right, thank you, that's just good context. Um, so the way I think we wanna do this is if you have a question, come right down to Brianne. We ask you to do that because she has a microphone so the TV audience can hear you. Maybe just a quick name ID and how you interact with the Skyways. And all our panelists are here to answer your questions. So any brave volunteers want to kick things off? Anyone have itching to ask the first question? Well, Sir? we do have a couple questions we haven't been able to get to yet. So let's, let's fire away. Let's start Now's that on. Uh, will the changes that we talked about towards for the ordinances need city council approval? Yes, they will all need city council approval. Um, so the plan is to introduce them at the city council after receiving feedback um, on July 19th. And then there are four readings in front of the city council before an ordinance is adopted. And the third reading, which will be on August 2nd at 5.30 p.m. is a public hearing. So that would be one of the opportunities in addition to, of course, writing and calling beforehand to express uh, your input. And then August 9th would be final adoption. Thank you. Another question. So many people get lost in the skyways. Can the maps and signs be improved? <laughs> Thank you. Great question. And we're on top of it. That's one of the questions that it raises. Oh, what about the signs? How do we do better wayfinding? So there's two things going on. Um, first of all, updating of signs with an app with a little code on it so you can actually get the app and will actually show up on your phone to show you exactly where you are. You can click on different sections of the Skyway, know if there's any restricted hours, what's the name, and things like that. So the new maps we're hoping to have up either in July or August. Uh, we'll be updated, clear in terms of we're taking off some of the clutter, so fewer building names, but every building that's on the sky will be named, as well as in that app. In addition to that, one of the projects on our work plan, which is after the security, after the maintenance, is to look at wayfinding and how we do a better wayfinding throughout the Skyway system. But the maps are coming, the wayfinding will be a little bit down the road. Unpredictable access to the Skyway is dangerous at night. Can some access be required? Currently, the city law or ordinance is that the skyways have to be open from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. Currently, they don't all close at 2 a.m. You can't be open longer than that. You're not supposed to be open any shorter than that. I know that there are uh, some issues going on currently with some of the buildings that are proposing uh, to close earlier for their own safety issues. Um, St. Paul Bowman does not support those initiatives. We support the current hours uh, as enforced, uh, 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, we also, full disclosure here, would support a 6 a.m. to midnight hour change, but we are holding off on any real advocacy of that until we complete our um, risk assessment study as well as recommendations from our consultant that we're looking to hire here coming up the next month. Um, but yes, I think all the skyways today need to be open from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. They, they do. No, absolutely. And uh, not, not to contradict that at all. And actually, I think that's one of the things we can be most proud about of our skyway system in St. Paul. It's very different than our suburb to the west, um, where you can actually have totally different hours. And any single bridge that you walk through, you might find yourself at a, at a dead end because those are all privately owned and privately um, maintained, and, and hours are determined by each building owner. That said, the question might have been referring to being able to get into a building from the outside, which yeah. I've heard a lot about. Yeah. And this is where, and again, this is where the public conversation comes in. Um, this is a public-private partnership. Where we've come down to date is that it's, it's unfair to a building to require them to have all of their street level entrances open to the public when the businesses inside them are closed. Um, we believe the Skyway should be there as a thoroughfare for people who need to get from place to place, but asking building owners to take on the cost of, of having security at each of their street level entrances, uh, we've to date deemed that to be too big of an ask. So that's where you see some of the sort of private public partnership, what can we ask of each other, um, and a decision has been made to that to this point about that. Hi, uh, it seems like everybody has responsibility, but nobody has authority. Now I'm a longtime resident downtown. 
And um, you know, what Dorothy Day is looking for forty million dollars. Could could we not tie in them taking control of their client population with that money? They they don't vote. They don't clean up after themselves. So it's it's annoying. And I I'm, I'm at the Fitzgerald event here, and, and it's 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 embarrassing that you know every entry to the city is manned by a uh, you know non-traditional uh, emotional toll booths people looking for money and you must be able to pass some laws or restrictions to prevent that uh andy i wanted to bring you back in just because we haven't heard from you in a while i know the relationship with downtown and dorothy day has been discussed from many different angles but from your perspective you know what's the developing story there well i'm at the I'm certainly not an expert on the subject. I, I will say that a lot is, is being um, discussed as far as how to uh, deal with the homeless population in a humane manner. In other words, if we're going to say that, uh, that the homeless population can't sleep in the skyways anymore, then we need to find a solution for where they can go at night. We're not going to kick people out of the middle of the night and go zero. So uh, I'm not really involved in that end of things, and I know that a lot is going on. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, keep moving with the audience next. All right, what is your name, sir? Sarah Henry. Oh. And where do you live? Uh, River Park Loft. I was the generator of this whole thing back in February, uh, June, July 2006. My question is, we have two Skyway committees, one for the council, one for the Capital River Council. Why aren't they combined? What are you thinking? What's going to happen on this? Okay. Council Member Maker. So that's a great question. And one of the first things, I think to Tom's earlier point about lots of responsibility, no authority, uh, when I started delving into this, sort of figured out that there, it did seem to be like the, there was a lot, a lot of places for people to be heard, and then not a lot of places where action was taken and decisions were made. And looking into the original Skyway Ordinance, which set up the Skyway Governance Advisory Committee, there was always supposed to be a corollary committee, which was called a working committee, inside City Hall that the Governance Advisory Committee would advise. Makes sense, right? The problem is we never actually set up that working committee. Um, and it basically was just left to the Department of Safety and Inspections, which has some of the authority, but not all of it to take on the recommendations of the Skyway Governance Advisory Committee. So really what this is, is the working committee that was always meant to be a complement to the advisory committee. The advisory committee takes in feedback and advises, and we bring all the people together who collectively have the authority uh, to take the action. Uh, that's one question, though, I would add to that. The Governance Committee goes to the CRC board. They're the ones that do the recommendations. They work for the board, not for you. That's right, I think correct. Thank you, sir. And what is your name? Well, I'm a Mississippi, and I live in Gulf of Towers. I've lived here nine years. But I've gone through this first couple of comments. I've walked the Skyway for 40 years going to work, and it was safe. And then when it, and then it became not so safe. And then the Mall of America opened, and all the people went to the Mall of America to hang out. And then the Mall of America the, uh, police and everybody, they cut down, uh, and they were very strict, and so they couldn't do their shenanigans anymore in the mall, so they all came back to the skyway. And my comment is that the central station, the elevator is definitely needed, don't get me wrong. But that central station, I think, I'm a I think it's the uh, right right on the bus, and that, I mean, what? That, that, that my friends won't even go through that central station because they're so scared. And it's, I, I don't know why they, they can allow them to, to hang out. I know you can wait for buses, but why the police or somebody doesn't shoot them away? Sometimes I go to the right, the central station, there's three, four, five policemen sitting there, standing there, and it seems like there's just kids are hanging out, there's junk and, and, and trash all over the place, and they don't seem to, please don't seem to do anything unless they're killing somebody or shooting somebody. Okay, well, let's let so Commander Red respond to that. I have, I have, I have, I have, Briefly, please. We have a lot of people to get to. We've lost the lights now, too. Uh, the question is, we're not going to get less people. We're going to have more people with those young people. And with those dark day, we're going to have more homeless people. And so what we need is a, a, a bathroom, a public bathroom, somewhere around Johnson Hall, so people can go to party. Most cities have public bathrooms. Okay, well, a lot to respond to there. Thank you. Uh, Commander Redke. And I apologize for not using Commander before. But uh, to add on to that, the words safe, unsafe, and uncomfortable. Are the Skyways unsafe, and what is the 
what is the level of risk to users of the Skyder system today? Well, I think, you know, it's unsafe, it's uncomfortable, it depends on the person. But let me address the, the question directly. Um, we are discussing about putting in a public bathroom that's not Del Tai. You know, it's been talked about, it's been uh, looked at, it's, it's still ongoing. As far as when you see officers standing around and kids standing around or youth standing around or young adults standing around, standing around at a public MTC uh, sidewalk waiting for a train or a bus, they can stand there all day. I, I can't tag them for standing there. So, like I said earlier tonight, what was disorderly conduct or loitering 20 years ago, 10 years ago, today it's not. And I, I'm not sure if that's right or wrong, but that's why we're going through and we're, we're trying to rewrite the, uh, the city ordinances to adapt to what we need them to go forward with. And that's why tonight's meeting is important, because we get your input. And I, and I, I mean, that's why we're here, is to hear it in response. You, you know, speaking of that, we had one more show of hands exercise we wanted to do, and this is as much for the panel's benefit when we talk about getting the input, but playing off that question and comment, I'd love for you to show hands of how many people in the room favor a stronger but respectful police presence to more strictly enforce Skyway rules. Show of hands. Okay, it looks like the, the majority in this room. Um, Regarding Skyway hours, another show of hands, and I'll do this one at a time. Do you favor no change to current policy? Okay, thank you. Do you favor closing at midnight? All right, do you favor close at 8 p.m.? One hand. And anything else that I hadn't maybe hadn't mentioned? Yeah, okay. you didn't mention staying open 24 hours. Okay, staying open 24 hours, thank you. A couple hands on that one. Okay, um, another question by show of hands. How many believe that all Skyway entrances should have the same open and closed times? That would be to my eyes about a 50 50 split, I would think. I guess I would infer, I think you meant the street, Skyway entrances, I would guess, street level, you know, to get up into the Skyways, to be able to access the Skyway system. So I'll do it again based on that <laughs> clarification. How many feel that all the, uh, your ability to reach the Skyway should have a universal time frame, should always be the same? Okay, still, still kind of a split. Um, do you think, how many believe pets should be allowed in the Skyway? Okay. And then last show of hands question, how many believe we need changes and clarifications to the business owner's requirements for security adequate to keep the Skyway safe and accessible? What's that? It's a good point. It's a hard exercise to be precise. But just in general, do you, do you favor a re-examination of new policies? Okay, yeah, this is a lot to throw at you, I realize. Um, so how many people believe that we really do need a re-examination of business owners' policies and responsibilities to the Skyway system? Okay. All right, thank you. Let's keep, thank you for doing that. Let's Can keep I just say one thing on that point? Where's that voice coming from? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I, I apologize. It was an oversight not to have a printout of those uh, changes, proposed changes here. We did have them on the presentation, but we shouldn't have trusted technology. So uh, we've contacted um, our, our angels in DSI, and they're going to be running over some copies to us here. So apologies for that. Okay. Let's uh, keep going with audience questions. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you. I just wanted to go back to the uh, discussion about the, the light rail vertical connection. There are two things I want to point out. One is that you know we just have to get used to the fact that our culture is changing, and you may not feel totally comfortable going through the light rail, but that's different than feeling unsafe. I think that our job is to make sure that. You're safe going to the light rail. We, we can't turn things back to the 1950s. Okay, be, okay so uh, that's one thing I want to say. The other thing is I just want to make sure that people understand that the Met Council is similar to a building owner in the sense that they own the light rail station, they own the vertical connection, they own the skyway above it. So they have, in a much the same way, they have the same responsibilities that another building. Can you talk up a little loud? I'm sorry. Are yes. I'll, I'll speak into the microphone more. I didn't know if I was uh, holding it too close or not. But what I'm basically saying is that the Met Council is a very large building owner in downtown St. Paul, but they are a building owner, and they have much the same responsibilities that other building owners have. Okay. That's, 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 
help them maintain their portion of the skyway? If that's the problem, and Met Council owns that section, that is the one of the dirtiest, most vandalized sections of the skyway. So maybe we should enforce the rules and enforce that arrest. Thank you. Let's be sure to let the people who waited in line get their comments in too. Do you want to react to that briefly, uh, Commander okay. Red? Well, I mean, we do hold them accountable. We are, I mean, we're constantly upgrading the, the performance down there with working with uh, MTC. You know, I, I don't, sometimes people, the perception is nobody's watching or nobody's there to fix things. We're working the, you know, the best we can with what we have to work with. And we've added uh, security down there. We've added uh, new paint, new carpet. We're, we're trying to keep up with it. So we're trying to adapt and, and what's going on in that area. And, and some of our numbers are down in that area. So it's a, I think we're working in the right direction. Dan, you have a reaction? Yeah, uh, thank you, David. Um, to that point, this is where your power lies. The more complaints we get, the more calls to the St. Paul Police Department when there's criminal activity, the more resources will go into it. Um, what we look for is, and that's why this is an important conversation for me, is we need to know where the issues are. And when we have a complaint to respond, one of our challenges that we've had around maintenance, we through complaints, we realized we had a lack of a tool, and that's what we're working on for our tool around enforcement, around maintenance. But it's really important for yourselves is if you are seeing issues in the skyway, that's not the standard of your community. You set the standard. Today, tomorrow, what this community sets as the standard will be the standard for the city of St. Paul. Our job is to work with you. So as you're walking through the skyway, you're seeing spots, dirty carpet, um, graffiti on the wall. We need to know about it. 8989. Uh, with that, we will put resources behind it. In addition to it, in regards to the wiring or the behavior on the central station or anywhere in the skyway system, the criminal element or those who are just you know acting antisocially don't want to be around people who are the, the positives in that. And so by yourselves walking through the skyways um, and when there's issues around blocking um, and other things that are impacting your ability to move or if there's intimidation, that's where you call the St. Paul Police Department. But you really are the eyes and ears. You give us the resources, the information for us to do things. So I really encourage you to create that presence in this skyway. This is your skyway. This is our skyway. Your presence and you sharing that information with us gives us the power to take action on these things. So that's where, in regards to changing this, your presence, just like the private property owners providing a security presence, just like the St. Paul Police Department providing their presence, is what's going to win the day in all of this. So that's where keep calling in, keep working with us. Uh, we'll get, keep getting information out, and we'll be moving this in the right way. Thank you, Dan. Can I get that phone number one more time, please? It is 266. 8989, and just a little ad advertisement. advertising. If you ever have a question about who to call or information for the city of St. Paul, that is your one call in. 8989. Okay, we do have a long line, so please, if possible, let me know who you want to direct your question to and try to keep it brief. I don't want to rush anybody, but I do want everyone to speak. Thank you for your patience, Rod. Ron Halverson, uh, president of City Walk and former member of the Capital River Council and the Skyway Advisory. This question is to the council. Uh, uh, member uh, and also to Andy because um, it would probably take a change in the ordinance. Um, I think that as a potential compromise to having every single building having to stay open access wise at the street level up to the skyway, is it possible the city council could negotiate with or mandate by ordinance, you know, up maybe about two on the east, two on the south, two on the west? Uh, where there's common uh, elements that people expect to be open and, and negotiate some kind of an agreement that they remain open for the hours that the Skyway system is open. Maybe there will be additional cost to the private owner. That's the first question. The second question is, is there any chance of having a new kind of relationship rather between the city and each individual uh, owner of property is there some way of uniformly working with the uh, members, especially the businesses on the Skyway, and setting up a uniform security system and video system and a way of tracking people that are misbehaving from one building to the other? Council members, can I start with you? 
Yeah, so I, I really appreciate the suggestion, and in response, I'd say anything is possible. Um, we are, I really believe that the security consultant that Boma is hiring, that the security task force is hiring, is going to come back to us with some really helpful information in that regard. One thing that they're looking at, for example, is whether all portions of the Skyway system are, are the same in the sense of both security and the need for access. And if they come back and say, you know, there are certain parts of the Skyway system that might not be as necessary at certain times of day or, or need more security, that might help us make the case, for example, to building owners that there are certain entrances that are that are more critical. I think at the same time, um, absolutely, the idea of having building owners come together and form some sort of cooperative arrangement to manage the Skyways would certainly make things a lot easier for us as a city. Uh, it is something that has to be initiated by the building owners themselves, it's obviously not something that we can mandate. But I guess, um, full disclosure, I'm hopeful that if there is, are suggestions that come back about security, they're likely to be coordinated and they're likely to require some level of private coordination, and I would certainly welcome that conversation. Thank you. Uh, Brianne, next. Your next question. Right. And what is your name? My name is Jean Hall, and I work in the River Park Block building. And I just a couple of comments on whoever would like to answer, that would be helpful. Uh, this one was really what the gentleman was just talking about. In the olden days of the Skyways, there used to be four entrances to the system that you could count on being something that could go from the street into the Skyways. Well, those buildings and those entrances are long gone, so um, I've lived here all my life, and I don't know how you get in the Skyways from the street level. Um, I know you can't get in by barrio because they shut those. I know you can't get in by public because they shut those. And they shut the entrances um, based on not whether there's anything open or not, it's just when they shut them. So I think finding a way to at least guarantee that there's um, access in different sections, even if you have to walk a block or something to get a a, a later entrance, that's maybe okay. And I don't think a building should have to keep open every one of its entrances, but something that would be manageable where they could have security and people could come and go at uh, several different places that are guaranteed. And then please tell people about it. Like they have a sign on the outside that says, two skyways. Well, look, if, if I may just jump in there and direct it to Beaumont, yeah. Jerry, I mean, every exit in the state of Minnesota, you can clearly see signage works. Could there be some sort of logo design competition and, and answer that with some sort of illuminated interface or something? We're not opposed to that. I think the challenge today is every building is empowered to do their own thing. And I think the benefit of Council Member Maker and Deputy Mayor uh, and Highway Vitality Work Group, the outcome of that is pulling all these different parties together and talking about all these different issues coming up with a common plan. Um, we've got the police involved, we're looking at activity reports, we're talking about you know the um, behaviors, all things like that. But it's also how do we get into the skyway? Is it a one size fits all or is it a let's really drill down to that next level and say that there's a central spine that we have to maintain and then hops off of that that don't all have to be open at 2 a.m. or midnight. And, and Jerry, when you're talking to your business peers, if it came down to a conversation like this about maybe partial entrances, is it a game of not it? I mean, is that how the community is going to react or is it, am I misreading that? No, I, I think there's a greater desire to reach out to your neighbor across the street as a building owner. And one of the things we're trying to do is to bust out of the take care of your own building concept and talk to your neighbor, figure out what your neighbor is doing. If, uh, if one of the things we're trying to do is put in place a central uh, communication plan. We already have a pager system in place now that we can buildings can page the police directly to report something. But there's also a um, kind of a glorified walkie-talkie system where buildings can talk to buildings and try to get to a centralized uh, video camera system. So if a perpetrator, for example, or somebody is bad behavior is going through your building, you don't just don't pawn them off to the next building across the street. You're letting that, if you look at the Mall of America, they can track people through this entire Mall of America down to the transit station, seeing them get on a train and get out of the, of the location. That's what we'd like to do from the mobile standpoint also, is have a centralized video system where we're communicating throughout the, the Skyway system with each other and we can let people know if somebody's coming your way, 
Thank you. I just led me to think of two more show your hands questions, if you don't mind, for SPN. I'm going to uh, do a show of hands again. But um, just to, to ask this out loud, how many of you feel safe in the Skyway system? Show of hands. All right. It depends on the time day. I heard that. And then just the opposite, how many people feel unsafe in the Skyway system? Depends on, I'm hearing a lot of depends on the time. Okay, and then just kind of a follow-up question. We've been talking about sort of policy solutions here, and there's been a co side conversation about technology solutions. How many see the promise for improvement here in some sort of technology, whether it be buttons or cameras or something along those lines, technology being a solution? Okay, and how many people see either a policy or personnel solution? As a, as a stronger end of the Both? Okay. How many people? I know these binaries are ne never quite fair, but just to get kind of sense. Thank you. Okay, Brianne, let's keep moving. All right. And one question of Pete, please. State your name. Emily Larson. I live in the Market House building across from CHS Field. Uh, my question to you is more of a challenge. I'm hearing a lot of people frustrated with being approached for a dollar and all that kind of thing. My challenge to you is to keep inclusivity as part of your. Uh, foundation for this work. Um, if you look around tonight, there's a lot of white people here. A lot of old white people, frankly. And that is not representative of our society. So I want you to think about that. So. Yeah, I, I really want to thank you for raising that issue. And I think um, I, I actually want to offer a little anecdote in response to that because because I am, and I know we are keeping that first and foremost in our minds. And when we were talking at the Skyway Vitality Workgroup recently about the proposed code of conduct update, our city attorney, um, one of our city attorneys, Andrea Miller, who is a um, middle-aged white woman, said that as she was going through and thinking herself about what she thought was should be allowed behavior versus prohibited behavior in the Skyways, she was thinking about what, if she were to do it, would raise an eyebrow herself. Not something that if she were to do it, it wouldn't raise an eyebrow, but if a young black man were to do it, it would. So for example, uh, sitting, and I know we're getting the copies here, but sitting is something that is currently prohibited in the skyways. But thinking to herself about it, she thought, well, if I were sitting down for a moment... Can I ask you quickly, there, there's a lot of seats in the skyways. You know, like when I walk to lunch, you see seats, but sitting is technically not allowed. Yeah, so sitting is technically not allowed. Sitting, lounging, kneeling, and lying right now are not allowed. Um, and that's confusing. That. Um, on the floor, is that the distinction there? Uh, on the floor, or is there ledges? There's sit sitting. Okay. In so those seating areas that you see, like in the first Sorry, floor, like, those are viable. Okay. Now you're being invited to sit down. Sorry. Yes. Um, but so she was thinking about that and thinking that would raise an eyebrow for her. But lying down, as an older white woman, if she were lying down in the skyway, someone would probably stop and ask her what was wrong as well. Um, and that would be true regardless of demographic. So that really is the lens that we're looking at, and I think we all need to keep that first and foremost. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I want to let Commander Radke jump in because, as you know, uh, your employees, your department was kind of pulled into this race conversation last year around skyway ordinances. What, kind of your thoughts and reaction to that. I'd love to hear your take. How race plays into this conversation? I, I mean, I don't think race plays into it at all. That's how the ordinance is on course. Uh, I mean, I, we collect the data, we collect uh, some data on race, like according to uh, traffic stops. But as far as stops in the skyway, we, we don't collect race as a, as a collection uh, thing as a, as a traffic citation. Okay, thank you. Can I add a comment to that? Sure, yes. And I think it gets back to the very first comment we talked about tonight, that the Skyway system is this quasi-public-private enterprise that goes to the city of St. Paul downtown for. And getting back, for example, the first bank building issue a year or two ago, people need to understand that the Skyway bridge across the street is all part of the Skyway. Once you get into the building, it might be a 20-foot wide corridor but it's only about a 10-foot easement down the middle that's part of the public corridor in the Skyway. Five to seven feet left and right of that belongs to the building and considered their private space. So they might be seating off to the side, like in the first bank building, for example. That's their private space for their tenants, their clients. It's not technically considered part of the Skyway, though it's, you know, right over the invisible line. And that's the challenge I think that the police has also enforcing this and the buildings is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of gray area here we're trying to monitor, provide, but also enforce. 
Thank you, Jerry. And just to say out loud, I am definitely sensing the body language here. I know there's a lot of strong opinions in the room. It is just a good reminder that this email is going to be a pivotal tool in this conversation. We won't be able to say it all in this format, but please, you know, make notes of your thoughts tonight and downtown live quarterly at Gmail. Send those in. They will inform this conversation. Okay, Brianna, thank you. Right. Take your name. My name is Frank Kozlowski. I have over at Mears Park Place Apartments. Um, I've lived over there for 21 years, and I've worked over there for 21 years. I have a question about the St. Paul Police Department. A lot of their officers come over when we have issues over there, and they just send people on their way, no matter what the issue is, unless they really do something bad, and just get sent on their way because they were told that how to handle things. That's why you're not hearing about it, or the council are, are not hearing about it, because they've been told, send them on their way, that's how it works. And it's been like that for about a year and a half, two years, and that's why all these problems closing at two in the morning. They need to stay up until two in the morning. If we get rid of those issues again that we're having up there, it, it'll take care of it. You know, there's natural consequences. Commander Rad, can you respond to that one? Sure. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I, I don't remember. There's no, there hasn't never been a standout order from the mayor's office. There's never been any anything like that. So it's hard for me to generalize without seeing exactly what's going on. The, the challenge we have downtown in law enforcement, we have a large population that's homeless, we have mental illness, and I can't arrest my way out of this. I, I can't spend my way out of it, I can't arrest my way out of it. So we gotta come up with a different plan. It's also important to note that we're not the only community that is having a problem with this. It's across the country. And I think we lose sight of that, and here we want a quick fix. There is no quick fix. There's not a silver bullet. There's not just one thing we can do to make it go. There's, it's a multitude of things. It's a multifaceted problem that requires multifaceted solutions. And sometimes it's by trial and error. But I, I got people in the Skyway. I've got people in Mears Park that camp out. If I wrote, if, if the tag gets issued or a citation gets issued, they're not going to pay the citation, whether it's a million dollars or a dollar. So we're really in a quandary sometimes in, in how we handle this. And we need to re-examine how we deal with mental illness and how we deal with homelessness. Simply warehousing them has not worked. It's not going to work. So how do we move forward with that? And we have to do that with our partners in business, with our partners in government. That's the only way this is going to work because not one of us in government or out here are going to be able to handle it. Would this be a good time to ask uh, maybe Councilmember Naker about the Dorothy Day survey effort that's going to uh, commence about talking to the homeless community and asking for reasons why they don't feel they can stay in the shelter? Is that part of this, this process now? Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up. So there, there are, I completely agree with Commander Radke, this is not, there's not going to be a quick fix and we do need to take a holistic view. Um, I want to commend the St. Paul Foundation who has really led the way in this working with Ramsey County. Um, they, they led an initiative called Rush, redirecting users of shelter to housing. So one of the things they were discovering to get to how complicated this problem is, is that there were many long-term users of shelter who weren't moving into housing. And so that took up shelter beds from those who really needed them on an emergency basis. So they identified 100 long-term users of shelter and they literally went name by name down the list, Joe, and Mike, and Fran, and found each of them a place to live. And at this point, I believe they've got 39 of the 100 permanently housed with supportive housing, which is which is extremely impressive. Um, they're continuing with that work, but now they're moving on to those who cannot, who are not using shelters. And there are, there are three reasons often why people aren't using shelters, and they all start with P, partners. Often shelters only allow one gender in, in the sleeping areas. Pets, and they, they can't bring their pets into a shelter, and property, if they have a lot of stuff and they can't bring it into a shelter. Um, and so they're now making a list of people who have those issues who aren't using shelters and who are instead um, using skyways or using transit um, and trying to find exactly what the issues are and one by one figure out um, a place for them to go as well. And I will say that as, as a city, we are also talking to Ramsey County about making sure we have enough emergency shelter beds because we can't ask our officers when it's 20 degrees below zero and they encounter someone in the skyway we can't turn that person out onto the street, and it is inhumane to expect them to spend the night either in the skyways or in our buses or trains, which is what's happening right now. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also comment that I believe uh, St. Paul Police Department has done a lot of crisis intervention training, which can kind of take team off of that. I don't know if Commander Red, do you want to fill the group in a little bit more on that program? 
Uh, yes, all of our officers have gone through crisis intervention training, and it's ongoing training um, because of the population. And, and we're changing how we do business, too. So there's a lot of dynamics that are going in. It's kind of a perfect storm of what's going on downtown uh, and where things are. Uh, I'm Don Anderson. I live in uh, Landmark Towers, condominium. And uh, you mentioned the asset. Um, which we prefer more, technology or policy um, solutions. And, and there's a third area that needs to be addressed, and that's community solutions. Uh, as an example, uh, building a residence, uh, uh, like neighborhood, where one big community of several thousand people, but each neighborhood a section in, in the skyline is different. And we can organize ourselves, have block parties, and, and building. Uh, club where we communicate with the building managers and come up with local solutions to the problems we've been talking about. And uh, I'd like to see more uh, attention to this uh, solution being a community-wide solution. And I have a question, and, and it's for the Department of Inspection, I guess. Uh, is there something that we can do uh, to get uh, 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 building managers, like like the, for the, the building managers for the the old St. Paul Pioneer um, Trust Building, um, they they live in, in South Dakota. Uh, they haven't done anything to their building for a couple of years, and it is the worst uh, source site on on the sky. And and is there some way to keep those kind of owners? out of the skyway uh, or force them to do something that will fix the, 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 the skyway. Yeah. And that gets to the side conversation we were having before the, the debate tonight about teeth on these ordinances. You know, what options does the city have when there's just a, a clear non-compliance issue? And that's one of our struggles. And that's why one of the things we will be bringing forward is ordinance amendment language to give us more specific tools. To clearly having a clear standard, what those expectations, and then tools in place to be able to enforce it, whether it be a criminal site or a civil site. But that's one of the the weaknesses we have in the system. We don't have the tools we need really to maintain that. We've been working with the property owners there. Uh, we've seen some progress, but. Clearly, as we all know, that's not the standard for the city of St. Paul, but that is one area we are working on right now. I'd like to respond to the first part of your comment, Ron. The Capital River Council would like to be the organization that represents residents, but I don't think we've done a good enough job of that in the past. I think this <coughs> event is the beginning of us doing a better job at that. I just want to say, I don't want the Department of Safety and Inspections to sell itself too short. The reason that that pea-soaked carpet in the Pioneer Press building was ripped out was because of complaints from you and DSI's actions. So it doesn't all, sometimes the teeth is just bringing to the attention of the property owner from the city that this action needs to be taken and that's sufficient. Thank you. Ruth Markowitz um, from City Walk. I, um, my question has to do with the emptiness of the fire system. I've lived in City Walk for 18 years, and I've called Officer Radke a number of times and Rebecca, and Rebecca a number of times about what's going on there. But so everything we're talking about in terms of security and cameras, I agree with. I mean, I, I really want a coordination of that. But what I'm aware of is that the whole fire system is like a dead zone. And my question is, what is being done to bring and draw businesses downtown so that what kind of perhaps money or incentive for even young entrepreneurs who might want to come down and dare to be in the Skyway system to bring energy in and variety in? And also I've wondered about just walking by all those empty storefronts just putting Helen and Tom in my building, they, they were doing they have art in one of those spaces. What would happen if you brought kids and did art so that those spaces didn't look so horribly bad because it's a depressing place now? Thank you. Um, does anyone on this panel have relationships with the, the new young owners of Percolate right here in this building? Anyone know them? 
That's true. So that, that's a story that you know, with two young people my age, they started a business just recently. I've gotten to know them, and I've always been curious what that relationship was like starting. But who, who, would you like to direct your question to someone in particular? No, I mean, my question is what is being done, and I will still say, why do we not have a movie theater that is like a landmark or uptown movie theater that would draw people from the suburbs is this, is this, to a diner? This is where I have to do my mandatory plug of Twin Cities PBS. <laughs> Just across the Skyway, our new street space is wonderful. We'd love to have you over for some of our film screenings. No movies. I just have to do that. Okay, does anyone want to, uh, sorry, I was trying to be too flippant there. Does anyone want to respond to the concerns? I would say in terms of the um, Skyway space, the cell, the one tenant, that's more of a building issue, not a city issue. So that's building space. Um, the city could probably reach out and see some sort of incentive program. Um, but, you know, there's financial strap issues all over the city and a lot of initiatives in place. and things planned. I don't know how to best about that. Just continue the dialogue and maybe the Skyway committee that we have going on right now. And the Skyway Vitality Work Group, that's what we're talking about. It's only six months in and we're trying to address the safety and security and maintenance and vibrancy issues. But that's another, you know, agenda item we can add to the list. May I ask you a quick follow up to that, Jerry? I've always wondered this. When do business owners tied to the Skyway system make their money? Is it the lunch rush or the business crowd, or is there enough of a critical mass of a residential population now? When, when is the real financial driver of that system? I would say it's, it's the uh, 8 to 5 crowd. It's the, the tenants in the building that are using those services, going out to lunch and Come up here, uh, like John Mill will have a and you know, restaurant. You can speak to uh, Mayor Coleman and Councilmember Tolbert's initiative in regards to trying to bring entrepreneurs, especially in the tech sector, into the city. I can, although I'm going to defer to Dan and then I will just say And I was going to say, unfortunately, you don't have the right people at the table for that conversation. Our planning and economic development, I knew, are no way of doing a lot of work around that in terms of for existing businesses, try to make sure they're staying and growing here, attracting new businesses into our city. There's the Innovations Cabinet, which I'll let Councilmember Nathan talk about. But that would be the staff that would really talk about that. Unfortunately, they're not here tonight, but there is a lot of work going into attracting and retaining uh, businesses in our city. And I really appreciate the question because it's one of my top priorities as a council member is to make sure that downtown is economically vibrant and all, and all parts of our city. Um, so I think there's a couple things. The city's responsibility, I would agree, bringing in specific businesses, giving incentives for those, I think um, isn't necessarily the best place for us to play. I think the best use of public dollars is making sure that our infrastructure is sound and that our streets and our skyways are safe and vibrant because that's what's going to encourage more people to invest here. We have an awesome city. and. And we're doing a better and better job of telling that story all the time. But we need to make sure that people aren't concerned about things like our skyways, like trash, that sort of thing. So I think one of the city's roles um, is exactly the conversation that we're having here. We have actually launched a couple initiatives this summer. You may have seen Carrie's Donuts up at the top of the vertical connection. We're doing a lot of the central station activation. You're going to see food trucks on that muddy triangle by a central station this summer um, to try to make the Skyways more exciting places to be and, of course, safer places to be. Um, we have a number of exciting commercial development opportunities right now. The Osborne 370, which is the Ecolab Tower that's going to be redeveloped, 280,000 square feet of creative class commercial space coming online. We have the Woolworths building. So I think there's a lot of momentum bringing new businesses here. We can do a better job always, but I think that's where things are turning. As a city, I want to make sure people feel safe and welcome uh, when they're downtown. And then finally, the mayor and my colleague, Councilmember Chris Colbert, have put together this tech and innovation cabinet, which is specifically looking at ways to attract those sort of creative class, millennial-driven entrepreneurial jobs. And, I'm, and I think they're coming out with recommendations in the next couple months. What is the, what is the fate of what you described as the muddy triangle? What's that going to be? Thanks for the money triangle for a second. I was like, I'm not sure where that is, but I'd love to know where it is. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the fate of the muddy triangle, which is the triangle that, well, you all know where it is, right? It's the central station. Um, is a little unclear. I can tell you my vision for it is that we, uh, I think there needs to be a skyscraper on that location that straddles the vertical connection so that you actually can go to work, to where you live, to your hotel, take the elevator down and get immediately onto transit. That's the way world-class cities have designed their transit. Um, the problem with that right now, and it's, our, it's the middle of our central business district, so that's exactly where we need to be capitalizing on density rather than having it be a, a muddy field. The problem is that it's owned by a bunch of different parties. Um, and similar to Skyways, where, where there's lots of different 
cook in the kitchen, sometimes it's easy to do this instead of take action. Um, those parties have been doing this for quite a while. So I actually now have monthly meetings with uh, Metropolitan Council, our Housing and Redevelopment Authority, um, and our attorneys to try to move that process forward to get all the land into one person, one organization, one entity's hands so we can start to redevelop it. But long term, I personally, and I've heard some others, would like to see a very high density use there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Barry Cipra, also from CityWalk. I'll address this question to Councilmember Maker, since ultimately the, the City Council will be making many of the key decisions. It's obviously being proposed to restrict the uh, closing hour of the Skyway system to midnight, and it's evidently been suggested to constrict it to even earlier, since it's 8 p.m. I'd like to know what is thought to be gained by closing earlier at midnight or closing earlier at, at 8 p.m. Or conversely, what, if anything, is thought would be lost by making the Skyway system 24-7? It's a great question. and. Um, the the answer is that I'm not sure, and that's why I really want to hear from you. I haven't actually proposed that yet, um, officially. I think the reasoning behind having it in pencil right now is exactly what we were talking about earlier, that balancing act between the public-private partnership and what we're asking of our private building owners um, and what they're, what they're getting in exchange. So when we first put the public easements in place that govern the Skyway system, Downtown is pretty much a 9 to 5 operation, and so all of those Skyway restaurants that benefit from having the 9 to 5 crowd, it was really easy, I think, to see the benefit in that as a building owner, to have your employees and your tenants be able to get to those. Now that we have almost 9,000 people living downtown, that's very exciting, by the way, 9, 000, almost 9,000 people, uh, that's right, yeah. We are, it is a different feel, and so now residents are seeing the benefit of this public asset, which I think is a terrific thing, but it requires some renegotiation, um, because building owners question, you know, do why should we be paying the security cost to have our buildings open until 2? We don't see a lot of people walking around between midnight and 2, um, and 2 hours every day is, is a cost saving. So I think that's where we're trying to be sensitive to those concerns and, and be realistic about when the skyways are most in use and when they're needed. They close at 2 a.m. now, um, not 3, not 4, somehow that line was drawn. So the question is, where's the new, the renegotiated line, or is there a renegotiation? As a citizen, to be able to go from 1 to 3, 1 to 2 a.m., 1 to 3 a.m., this is a violation. And I should have the right to go anywhere I want, just like anybody else. Councilmember, would you like to respond to this? I should say out loud, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in here, but we have hit the 6.30 mark, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so if you do have to leave, no offense taken. Um, I did talk to Bill. We're going to go a few more minutes so we can get more comments in. But please, if you do have to go, it is 6.30 now, and we won't take offense. Hey, Andy, I'll, I'll just respond to that and say you're absolutely right. You should be able to go through the skyway the same as anybody else. The question is whether everybody should be restricted to uh, earlier than 2 a.m. And that's something that you know our public officials need to hear more about. Do we really want to close the skyways earlier? Uh, while I have the mic, I would just like to mention one thing, which is that it's great that you all showed up here tonight, but there are regular meetings of the Skyway Committee, the Capital River Council, other committees that you can attend and have a great deal of influence over the policies that we're talking about. Thank you. And are we now handing out the proposed policy changes? Is that what's come into the room? Yeah, the presentation that was supposed to be up here, as well as sort of Skyway 101 that covers a lot of what we talked about is coming around. So thanks again to the effect of getting that on the slide. Okay, let's get some more comments in. We'll go about 10 more minutes. All right, this is for either the police chief or the mom council member. Um, uh, a lady remarked earlier that the central station elevator is one of the worst, and I can testify to that. Um, uh, when I saw this whole sort of thing at Central Station unfold, I sent the council an email last night that um, I think it was September of 2015, we had a really nice bus stop at 5th and Minnesota next to Central Station, and the city destroyed it. The city just tore down this huge, nice bus stop at 5th and Minnesota right before winter came. All of our, all the people that were loitering, lawyers who would just sit there doing nothing, decided that they needed a warm place. They went to the central station elevator. 
and about two months later, they just start reading newspaper reports of assaults in the Skyway. And so, uh, you know, and so a lot of these problems with the Central Station Elevator are people, they took our bus stop down, and now they're just hanging out in the Skyway. Okay, but so what is your question? Okay. What, um, what can we do about it is, why did they tear down our bus station? Does the police chief know? Is it gang violence or something? Why they tore this down? Do you want to Commander Radke to take this question? Commander? I don't know why they tore down the bus station. The uh, bus stopped down after we tore my time down. down. But, you know, the, the central station is kind of a misnomer because there's no, it's, it's a bus transfer. There's not really a station there. It's kind of the money triangle. So it's kind of a bad, a bad name. Um, yeah, we, we have had, it's been displaced over in that area and, and it's because of the warmth. I know MTC has built some station or some shelters over there with some warmth, but primarily they're designed that way because we want people to keep going in the transit. We want them to get on the next bus. We don't want them to stick around. So if they built a, a shelter there, a, a full shelter, it's, it's, we're going to have a problem then on that end. So I, I think we're trying to balance the happy ending there with trying to get people to move along but not get too cozy. Hi, I'm Brenda Massick and I uh, live in Army Park Condominium, down by Nurse Park. And I just, I don't have a question, but I just want to say how strongly I feel about keeping the skyways open until 2 a.m. I go off on airplanes, sometimes the flight comes in at 12.30 at night. And uh, it's nice to be able to take the bus down to the Union Depot and to be able to walk back through the Skyway, especially in inclement weather. And also, we do uh, attend the the venues up on the upside of the uptown area, and it's nice to be able to stop off and have a drink and then walk back into the Skyway and come through. And whenever we have anybody visiting us and we do that, everybody's like, "Wow, that is so cool!" And you know, don't lose it. Thank you. Uh, I'm Annabella Romer, and I'm representing um, Lions Court. I've been a resident since 2000. I worked, so I didn't spend time in the Skyway when I owned. I, I did spend time in the Skyway, then I was forced to move due to the cost of living downtown in the Skyway. And now my community has not been a safe place. We just got broken in on Saturday. Uh, another day we had someone that followed someone, went in. We are women. It was night, 10 o'clock. We bring it up to our management. They said there's nothing they can do. They put a sign on the door saying that you're responsible for your uh, participants or whoever you bring into. There's a lot of diversity in there. People with high they can't even afford to live there, but are living on their pension and their social security. There's some that I don't know why they put them in there, and they're disrupting our neighborhood. I've been damaged by one, and nothing was done. I have to say I'm a concerned citizen. I'm from a foreign culture. I know what poverty is and what is hunger. And I want to thank Rebecca, because one day we had an issue in our community by the freeway on 10th Street. And I looked at it as a concern. If all the flying stuff that was there by the homeless people, I have nothing against them, but it could have been an accident. And you know what? She was nice enough to take it forward. I only called and whoever answered, I said, you know what? You're looking for volunteers to clean parks and rec. But we have a bigger issue. And we don't want to have rodents. I already had three bugs in my apartment. And our management says, what can we do? You have to document and document and document. And sometimes we don't even know who those people are. And they infiltrate when the door opens because we have people with walkers. So my community is becoming an unhealthy. And I have to start thinking if I have to move out of downtown St. Paul. And that's very sad. We have a turnover. And I love St. Paul and I love downtown. I'm sorry to turn this off. I want, to, I want to make sure that there's communication between apartment dwellers, people who are making big bucks by renting to people who have to have a place to live. 
like myself. This may be a whole other can of worms. But, 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 I, but that's a concern because the sky was are closed, so they're coming now down to our neighborhood. To the previous woman who mentioned coming home on a flight, has there ever been any talk? I mean, if you have an apartment downtown, you have a key, you have door codes. Has there ever been talk about a residential code or, or a, a number that would allow someone who lives downtown to maintain access with some sort of extended security code? Has that ever come into the conversation at all? I think in the, the recent conversation that's come up with, you know, the keypads and things like that, but it hasn't really gone anywhere, but that's one of the, like right now we're really in this big conversation that people are throwing ideas, and that's one idea that has been tossed up. What's the thinking around that? Is that like putting key codes on sidewalks, since we essentially talk about this as a public private yeah. space, or what, what's sort of the philosophy? The idea would be is since uh, people live along the Skyway, their buildings connected into the Skyway, that there would be this basically closed sort of like corridor, as if you were a resident or you worked in one building, you would have access to that, the base of that space. One of the challenges with it, of course, is you know you have this great asset, that being the St. Paul pedestrian skyway system, that would exclude those people who weren't residents or working there. So any of our guests or, or people going to our venues would not have the opportunity to uh, take an opportunity of our, our skyway system. I also think that that points out another challenge without having a coordinated private ownership. If you think about what it would take to have a key fob that everybody, every resident downtown could access every single door, the logistics of that mean you would really need uh, the private building owners to all come together and agree to do that and coordinate. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I you're also not looking at workers. There are thousands of workers downtown who have no access to the skyway once they're off work. It's just about removing a the element that is an important part of downtown, and that's the worker. Yeah, you don't hear that? He's mentioning the worker community as well. Thank you, thank you. I have another question. Well, I, very briefly, because I have three yes. other people who have been waiting a while. Yes, and I've been waiting too. Uh, I have another concern. As a, someone that comes downtown to help someone work, not on a regular basis, but on call, I have, I've noticed I didn't even have time to find a place to eat unless I bought it. So if you bring your own food, you can't eat it downtown. I ate mine in the bathroom next to the old um, uh, office of River Council. The next time I went in, I got a system run by security. It says only floaties only. So I have to go to Arden and get something there, and then I ate my apple quietly. But when I come to help someone in her business, sometimes I don't even need that at all. Okay, thank you. That's well taken. You know, and that's a concern. There's no place for us to sit. Um, Good, well said. Okay, Brian, thank you. Right. Brian. And I will say, the security in court in the 401 building is open during business hours for anybody patronizing any of those establishments in that building. Hi, I'm, I'm a new resident uh, to downtown St. Paul, and I came be specifically because of the skyways. I plotted it out. Where can I go and not go outside when it's 20 below or not be outside too far? I can meet most of my needs on the skyway. My car sits down in the garage. I don't use it a lot. If, if the skyways are closed, there's no reason to be here. I'll just have to turn into another suburbanite driving around endlessly trying to find another place to park and go. I'm also a strong supporter of the arts, and I use the skyways to go from one venue to another. I live at one end, I go to venues at the other, and some in between. I see all the empty storefronts. I have a million ideas on how to use those storefronts. Uh, some might not make money, but I used to work downtown, and they've been sitting empty for 20 years. You know, it's like those people cannot be interested in making money because those spaces are empty. So why don't, why don't we get a group together to say, let's find a creative way to use this space. Encourage entrepreneurs, encourage artists, open up those spaces for free. That's my comment. Yes, thank you, and this maybe to Bill, for our, these are quarterly events, it seems like there's a lot of interest in sort of economic development. So maybe at our next event, we'll make that a focus of one Not of our economic, panels. cultural. Cultural as well, thank you. No, it's a good distinction. But that's something we can focus, that's a whole other conversation, but I think that's something we can hopefully focus on going forward. Thank you for your comments. Brianne, you wanna? David, I'm so sorry. At the risk of, I don't mean to monopolize, but I have to say three things. One, 
Welcome to downtown St. Paul. Thank you for moving here. Two, don't go back to the suburbs. We will figure this out. We're glad you're here. And three, um, the Family Vitality Work Group actually literally today had a conversation about public art um, both in the Skyways and, in, and possibly in some of those storefronts as well. Um, so please see me afterwards and we'd love to get you hooked up with the group that's talking about this session. Great. Good comment. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel and I live downtown St. Paul. I have, uh, the, when you're talking about the Skyway system and um, Belcher Plaza, places like that, you know, that are right in the Skyway, they should have these car keys at a certain point. So I think 2 a.m. is a good good time, I think, because there's, there's certain places along the way that you know, they don't have to be accessible to everybody, but I think the bank, you know, yeah, you should go to do banking anytime. You know. David, will you quick respond? Maybe Balmo would be appropriate for that? I don't have a response to that one. I just want to ask one more question for David. Of um, course, yeah. We're about to I don't want to be responsive to all users of the Skyway. I don't want to overlook. We have some people here that transport through the Skyway in wheels. And I want to make sure that the Skyways for the users of wheels are also accessible and friendly. And I know some buildings, to get from the Skyway to the street, you may have to take a stairwell. And obviously, that's a challenge. Do the Skyways work for you? And what issues and hurdles do you experience going through the Skyway system that some of us might not consider? I'm going to go with it. Was it Werner first? Sorry. Um, I can talk a little bit about the access. Most, most, as far as wheels go, can work out. But there are, are many doors that don't open, particularly doors where when you try and get the door open, you face with going down the steps. So it would be really nice to have all the doors have a button to push on the door open. Um, that wouldn't be a very difficult thing. Well, hold on. Just, I'm sorry. Just one question here. Is that when a door is not working, those mechanical doors? Is that another eight nine eight nine? Pick up the phone. If you walk up to a door and it doesn't. Or extension of that. But is that another use of the eight nine eight nine reference you made earlier? Is that an appropriate call? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Richard Minson, and I've lived downtown for 29 years. And one of the reasons that I continue to live downtown are the Skyway. And over those years, I know where to go and where not to go. So I, through my own experience, I know which ones to avoid. I know which ones not to go to. Uh, and uh, so I guess I find my way through the, the maze of the Skyways and that uh, that allows me to get where I get where I need to go, uh, you know. And the railroad building is one of those things that has been uh, they've been attempting to close that since 1992 when I first uh, uh, had an office across the street, which are the lofts now, and now they've worked out a, a way to close the building uh, by that that keypad. So I enjoy the Skyway because they're so smooth you don't get hurt. I have a couple of bad shoulders right now and when you're out of the street, bang, 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 it hurts a lot. Uh, so riding the Skyway uh, is just a beautiful, convenient and higher so preference than the sidewalk. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I hate to do it. I know how these events work. We all feel like we have more to say at the end than the beginning. That's why this is, will be an ongoing process. Um, one thought I had during this conversation, it is kind of cool that as the, essentially the inventors of these skyways, we're having a civic conversation that's never really taken place before. That's probably often why it gets complicated and heated. We'll continue it. Thank you very much for coming. Can we please thank our panel for being here? Tonight?